Visual Contrast Procedures 3 with Brandy Jones. Myelogram and Lumbar Puncture. Myelography, a radiographic study of the spinal cord and its nerve root branches using contrast media. To be more specific, the spinal canal, which houses the various nerves which make up the spinal cord. Generally, your doctor will order a myelogram when he or she suspects some physical deformity or problem is pushing into the spinal canal and putting pressure on the spinal cord. A myelogram can be of the neck, a cervical myelogram, the upper back, a thoracic myelogram, or a lower back, a lumbar myelogram. Generally, a water-soluble water contrast medium is used, which is similar in every way to the uh, dye used for IVPs and angiograms. Indications, indications of a lesion that may be present within the spinal canal or protruding into the canal. If a pathologic process impinges on the spinal cord, uh, patients may have numbness in the upper or lower limbs. Lesions may include herniated nucleus pulposus, cancerous tumors, bone fragments, cysts, um, and benign tumors. Contraindications, blood in the cerebral spinal fluid, CSF for short. The presence of blood in the cerebral spinal fluid indicates probable irritation within the spinal canal, which can be aggravated by the contrast medium. Arachnoiditis, inflammation of the arachnoid membrane, contrast medium may increase the severity of the inflammation. Increased intracranial pressure, tapping of the subarachnoid space, with a needle insertion may cause severe complications to the patient as the pressure equalizes between the areas of the brain and spinal cord. A recent lumbar puncture within two weeks of the current procedure. Performing myelography on a patient who has had a recent lumbar puncture may result in extravasation of the contrast medium outside the subarachnoid space through the hole left by the previous puncture. An allergy to iodine-based contrast medium. Patient prep and instructions. The patient should be NPO for a minimum of six hours prior to the procedure. The patient should thoroughly be informed about the procedure and advised of any complications. A history consent form should be filled out. Physical assessment, vitals, like blood pressure and pulse, should be taken prior to starting the exam. Premedication is given if necessary for patients with anxiety um, that may have anxiety about the procedure, so it may be likely that a sedative or muscle relaxant is prescribed or administered one hour prior to the exam to help with anxiety. Physical assessment, vitals, blood pressure, and pulse will happen again after the exam, but before going to CT. Post-exam, the patient will be taken to CT, and post-exam, the patient must remain in a semi-erect position for several hours. Patient prep and instructions. The room. The floor room is, is used and should be equipped with a table that has the ability to tilt 45 to 90 degrees. The movement of the table during the exam uh, positions such as erect and Trentelberg will facilitate the movement of the contrast um, in the area of interest within the spinal canal. The footboard should also properly be secured at the bottom of the table. Some facilities may also have shoulder braces and ankle strain restraints to help them secure the patient for the procedure. Patient prep and instructions. Supplies. Supplies have to be ready and available. Prepackaged myelogram tray is usually used sterile gloves for the doctor, know what size they wear, antiseptic solution, contrast, lidocaine, this would be an extra bottle. Usually your um, packaged myelogram tray comes with a small five or 10 milliliter uh, lidocaine. You might wanna grab extra just in case. Um, large positioning sponge or pillow that may also be handy. The pillow you wanna place underneath the abdomen to kind of create um, a little like hump in the back.
grid for overhead images if the doctor requests. Here is an example of a myelogram tray. Um, each myelogram tray may differ from department to department. It depends on what brand or what type you order. Um, some doctors use all of the contents in here and some only use one or two pieces. So um, it just depends on what your facility prefers. Here are some of the supplies that are in that tray. I'll start from left to right. So you have three sponge sticks that have the pink little sponges on the end. Um, they usually, um, there's a well in the contrast um, kit that has like a couple little ridges on it and has a deep little well. You'll pour your antiseptic solution in there, your iodine or betadine, and um, then you'll use these sponge sticks and you'll do your three small like separate circles all the way going inside all the way out um, to prep. There is a extension tubing. You have a set of test tubes for your specimens. If they want some, you have your stopcock. You have your fenestrated drape. You have your other sterile drape, usually over the handle for the tower. Um, five milliliter syringe with a needle. Then you have your spinal needle and your lidocaine bottle. It's usually um, 1% lidocaine. This is a 10 milliliter bottle. Some more additional supplies from left to right. This is your bottle of betadine, a contrast, a um, bag, specimen bag. That's what the samples will go in. Um, you have a 20 milliliter syringe, and then you have a 25 gauge needle. This is a spinal needle. Always grab it extra just in case to have in the room. And then you have a sterile cup. This is the only sterile cup I could find. Um, yeah. Patient prep and instructions. Patients should be changed into an exam gown after the procedure is explained, if not already in a gown. The opening should be in the back. Females should be asked to take their bra off. You can take an extra towel and kind of like tuck around their underwear and slide it down um, to protect their garments so they don't get any iodine on there. It will stain. Um, have the patient use the restroom prior to the procedure because it could take quite a while for um, us to do our procedure and then they get sent over to CT and they do their procedure and they want to keep the patient laying um, flat with semi-erect flat, like with their head up. So you want to have them use the restroom now. The most common myelograms are cervical and lumbar. Cistern puncture, the patient should be erect and the needle will be inserted in C1 to C2 level. This is a picture of the um, positioning for a cistern puncture. For a cervical myelogram, besides prone with the head flexed, the patient may also be seated this way. Lumbar puncture, the patient is usually prone. They're going to enter at the level of L3, L4. Of the two sites, this is the safer one. For a lumbar myelogram, the patient should be placed in a prone position on the table with a pillow at the head. And if the doctor um, allows, often the positioning sponge or a pillow is placed underneath the, underneath the abdominal area for the lumbar myelogram. Um, so you can flex the spine to help stabilize the patient and prevent movement. For contrast, we're going to use an iodine-based, water-soluble, non-ionic contrast. Um, an example here is Omni 300 and a OmniPake 180. More about contrast media. Ideally, the best contrast media to use is one that mixes well with CFS, easily absorbed, non-toxic, and inert, non-reactive. In the past, air, gas, and oil-based Ionated radiopaque media were used. Um, currently today, we use one that has relatively low osmolality, non-ionic, water-soluble, iodine-based media. Um, our OmniPake is one of them, VisiPake is another. Conscious media. Absorption begins at 30 minutes after the injection. So you really want to have everything in it ready and to go and get your images in this window. 
So absorption begins at 30 minutes after injection. It is easily absorbed into the vascular system. One hour, uh, at one hour, the contrast would have got, have a good radio opacity. From four to five hours, the contrast starts to get hazy. And 24 hours, the contrast would be undetectable. So it really goes through your system fast. For the injection, the doses may vary by the concentration of the contrast, but generally it is a nine to 15 milliliters that's used. Generally two locations are used for the puncture sites, which are the lumbar L3, L4, and then um, sometimes they use the cervical C1, C2 in the subarachnoid space. Trendelenburg, during the exam, the physician may place the patient in Trendelenburg position which um, to move the contrast, which is the head is lower than the feet. Care can be taken to prevent the contrast from reaching the head. To prevent the contrast from flowing into the cranial region of the subarachnoid space, you want to hyperextend the chin as is seen in this picture. Make them comfortable and let them hold still, just like this process for the radiographer. One, you want to prep the room and gather all supplies needed. Two, explain and consent your patient. Three, position the patient on the fluoro table. Usually the lead curtain would have already been removed before you brought your patient in. Uh, you'll have patient lay um, on their belly. You want to expose their back. You'll skin prep using the antiseptic solution. Lumbar puncture is usually the most common. So you, obviously they will be prone or in the left lateral position. Um, cerebral spinal fluid samples are collected after they um, would numb the area and insert the needle. Then they would take some cerebral spinal fluid off and usually collect it and send it away uh, for testing. You will need to go to the lab so you have your lab form. Contrast medium is instilled. The needle is removed to clean the area and the place a bandage on. You'll use the stretcher to transport the patient to CT uh, for additional imaging. And then the patient needs to um, remain laying down for the rest of the afternoon and the evening and take it easy. The radiologist will become sterile and clean the back with antiseptic solution, then drape with sterile towels. The radiologist will take some spot films using fluoro to mark the correct um, needle placement looking for the subarachnoid space at the correct level of the spine. The radiologist will use lidocaine and a local anesthetic to numb the area. Then the radiologist will insert the spine needle into the patient's back. The patient must stay very still. The location of the needle is verified by an unobstructed backflow of cere cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, the radiologist will move some spot wrist spinal fluid, then inject the patient with contrast dye. Um, the radiologist may tilt the table to erect and then into the Trendelenburg position to try to get the contrast to lay in the spinal canal where desired. Um, once the contrast has traveled to the desired area, the needle is removed. A few images may be acquired either by the radiologist or by the radiographer, um, depending on what the radiologist would prefer, maybe both sometimes. Uh, the patient is cleaned up and bandaged and then sent on a stretcher in a semi-erect position to CT for additional imaging. Then um, that's it. Cervical myelogram. Picture is demonstrating a lateral radiographic myelogram. This shows the compression of C5 and C6 uh, cervical disc herniation. Cervical spine positioning after fluoro. So your horizontal beam lateral, which is a cross table lateral. The patient is prone with the arms down by their sides and the shoulders depressed. The chin is extended and resting on the positioning sponge. CR is directed at the level C4, C5. Column eight, respiration should be suspended during exposure. So you also have a cross table lateral um, swimmers, swimmers lateral horizontal beam. The patient is positioned with the pro and prone still with the chin extended. For a right lateral, the right arm is extended along the right side of the body with the shoulder depressed. The left arm is superior to the head. The CR is directed to the level of C7. Now, this is opposite to what we are taught 
um, as far as irregular C-spine swimmers. Definitely want to collimate to the field and suspend respiration. Evaluation criteria for the cervical myelogram are the appropriate level with contrast medium present and demonstrated, optimal exposure factors, the patient ID and markers, and collimation should be evident. Thoracic myelogram, and then here's a really nice picture of part of a thoracic myelogram. Thoracic spine positioning after fluoro. You have a right and left lateral decubitus as seen in this picture here. Uh, the patient can be AP or PA. You have a horizontal beam. The patient would be in true lateral. The right arm is flexed and the left arm is extended. Make sure the spine is parallel. The central ray is um, directed at the level of T7. Suspend respiration during the exposure and collimate down to the size of the spine. Thoracic spine positioning after fluoro, left or right lateral. Patient is in true lateral. Make sure the spine is parallel. Central ray is directed at the level of T7. Suspend respiration during exposure and collimate down to the spine. The example shown is a left lateral. Here are some example images of a T-spine. The first one's EP, and then the next two are lateral. Lumbar myelogram. This is an excellent image of a lumbar myelogram. As you can see, the white here going through the spinal column uh, is all contrast filled. You can even see the spinal needle still in place. Procedure, a physician inserts a spinal needle into the subarachnoid space between L3 and L4. The spinal fluid is aspirated. The contrast is injected, outlining the spinal cord and nerve roots. As seen here, all the areas are, um, are pointing to the contrast in the spinal column. Lumbar spine positioning after fluoro. They call this a semi-erect lateral. Um, no matter which way you look at it, it's a cross-table lateral. It's just they might have the patient semi-erect to um, have the contrast where they need it to be. Um, so anyhow, this is a semi-erect lateral. It's really a cross-table lateral. Uh, the patient is prone with the arms flexed above the head or by the head. The radiologist will use fluoro while adjusting the table in the appropriate angulation. Um, this contrast concentration will be placed in a specific area. Uh, which can be visualized on your film, on your IR. The central ray is directed at the level of L3, suspended respiration during exposure, collimate to the size of the spine. Occasionally, you'll have additional projections. They may ask for obliques of the L-spine and or an AP or PA of the L-spine as well. Evaluation criteria for the lumbar myelogram is you want to be at the appropriate level with contrast medium present and demonstrated in your image. Optimal exposure factor, factors, patient ID and markers are evident, and collimation is evident. Myelogram, so the contrast media should be non-ionic, preferred water-soluble, iodine-based um, versus the oil-based. Uh, we no longer really use the oil-based, even though that was the best top kind, was during a myelogram, um, it's less chance of reaction and issues, use the water-soluble iodine-based. Um, one hour max of um, radio opacity uh, for the best possible images. Um, it's excreted into the kidneys. And here's a nice example um, of an RPO and LPO images. Here are some really nice images to show you why it's really nice to have the L3, L4 area. So the picture on the left, the termination of the spinal cord in the adult showing its variation. This is also the termination of the dural sheath. So um, it's important to go L at the uh, L3, L4 area uh, before the sheath ends and you can have the nice spinal canal. After we are finished, um, with our myelogram for regular diagnostic radiography, we will be sending the patient to CT for CT myelography. 
post exam. So you'll take your patient into your structure. Um, the patients should also be instructed to remain semi erect or flat position for several hours. Inform them that some symptoms, such as a headache, dizziness, or symptoms like um, may occur, if, but if they are really pers persistent for more than a couple of days, they should consult a physician. For 24 hours following the exam, keep the patient's head slightly elevated. Do not lay flat or allow your head to be lower than the rest of your body post procedure. Drink extra fluids to help flush the contrast through. Some side effects would be headaches, nausea, vomiting. I would call the provider or instruct them to call the provider if a headache develops with no relief, fever, stiff neck, tingling in the legs, unable to urinate. Headaches are usually a sign of a cerebral spinal fluid leak. And if left untreated, it can cause serious complications such as a subdural hematoma, seizures, which could be fatal. A blood patch may be needed to stop the cerebral spinal fluid leak. A blood patch is an injection at the spinal tap site with a small amount of blood from the patient themselves, and it's made into a mix, but I'm not sure what that mix is. Um, this will patch a hole in the as long as you use the original site. Um, in the dura, the outer membrane of the spinal cord, it can um, have immediate effect or it can take up to four to six hours to improve. Other contrast studies not found in Bontrager's lumbar puncture. The purpose of a lumbar puncture is to collect and analyze um, cerebral spinal fluid of the brain and spinal cord without contrast media. However, some difficult cases may end up having the need to be performed under fluoro. Contraindications, allergies to the anesthetics, blood and cerebral spinal fluid, taking blood thinners, increased intracranial pressure, and a recent lumbar puncture. Clinical indications, infection, inflammation, cancer, abnormal cerebral spinal fluid pressure, chronic pain in the lower back, weakness, and degenerative discs. Pathology, meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, multiple sclerosis, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Here is a tray, a lumbar puncture tray. This tray um, includes a 22 gauge spinal needle, which is three and a half inches long, a five milliliter syringe, a 25 gauge safety needle about one inch long, a 22 gauge safety needle about one and a half inches long, a filter straw, four by four gauze. Um, some kits um, will have five gauze, some kits will have 10. It says make sure you have the correct number and count them. A manometer, which is two pieces. Sometimes you need to, um, to measure the pressure. Extension tubing about five inches. A three-way stopcock. Four specimen vials with caps, usually about 10 milliliters. Three swab sticks. A marking pen. A fenestrated drape. Band-aid. And 1% lidocaine. A five milliliter or 10 milliliter bottle. And the package is your um, betadine. Other supplies, uh, sterile gloves for the physician, betadine. Sometimes the physicians like a lot more that come in the package. So um, usually you'll have a bottle of betadine to pour into the uh, tray. Kelly clamps, a biohazard specimen bag, an extra pillow to place under the abdomen, 18 gauge needle or a blunt fill tip needle um, and a 20 cc syringe. Trays may vary per site and per protocol. Here are just two different types of lumbar puncture trays. A manometer. Um, this is a device that will um, measure pressure in the spinal column. So a change in pressure will cause the cerebral spinal fluid to rise or fall, and this device is used to measure that. Here are some ranges um, for an adult and then a pediatric. Um, I personally have never had to do any pediatrics, um, only use the adults. It's pretty neat to see how quickly the um, 
if it's got a lot of pressure, it will rise. And then it takes a long time if there's hardly any pressure. So um, it's interesting. Procedure, gather supplies and prep the room. Remove the lead drape on the floor or tower. You want to change the patient into a gown and explain the procedure and have the patient lay prone on the floor or table. Some doctors may ask to have the patient in lateral instead. Use sterile technique and set up the lumbar puncture tray. Add additional supplies to the tray when asked. The physician should consent the patient and use sterile technique and antiseptic to clean and prep the area. Next, they will drape the area. Using the spinal needle or a pointer, the physician may under fluoro locate the correct spot. The physician will use lidocaine to numb the area, then insert the needle. The physician may use a manometer to check the pressure. The CSF will be withdrawn and placed into specimen tubes. You really need a lot of um, drops of specimen for a lot of these tests. So some tests require like 20 drops and some you know, require 10 drops. So you really usually try to fill at least three of those tubes out of the four. Um, sometimes they really try for four, but I know for sure they always try to fill three at least. Um, you want to place, take everything out, clean up, and you'll place a bandage over the site. It's pretty much the same as a myelogram, except for there is no contrast. The lumbar puncture is usually that in the lumbar, so it's usually um, going into L3, L4 space, shown here on the left. And shown on the right is an excellent picture of the lying position the, when they lay on their left side. Images. You may be asked um, for images of the lumbar area. So for gout, you may be looking at the spine prior to this procedure and aspiration. They may ask for an AP, a lateral. Of course, they can always ask for obliques. Um, post, it looks like it's the spine post procedure, usually AP and lateral. However, they could do um, obliques as well. Other radiography. Hip to ankle long bone measurement, scoliosis theories, conventional tomography, and digital tomosynthesis. A Bell Thompson ruler is an acrylic radiopaque extremity ruler. These rulers are used when the radiologist and or surgeon needs to indicate locations or measurements in the imaging field. They are also used for stitching um, for those type of procedures. Hip to ankle long bone measurement. This is hip to ankle bilaterally. You want to determine the limb length, discrepancies, and alignment. Measurements for surgery, perhaps. The IR is 14 by 52 inches lengthwise. Uh, the HKVP is 85 to 95 using a grid. Um, the wedge filter or an inner filter effect may be applied, although I don't think I've ever personally seen that for these. Um, it may be out there with different type of equipment. Um, you want to remove the shoes, position the patient AP standing, ensure both knees are in true AP. The central ray is perpendicular to the knee joint, and the image demonstrates bilateral lower extremities to include the iliac crest all the way down to the calcaneus. Scoliosis series. Scoliosis and or long leg imaging. Um, things are always changing in the world. How to perform a scoliosis procedure with more modern equipment. Um, with this, you can perform using a digital uh, for scoliosis imaging and long leg imaging. This is an example of an ortho stand. Um, you can have the patient stand up there. They have um, bars on the sides to be able to hold on. You can perform your AP and lateral erect. And also you can see kind of in the background leaning on the tower there is the Bell Thompson ruler. Directions. Now these are specific to this device. Um, so place the ortho stand in front of the erect bucky, but not touching. So the bucky can be moved up and down during the procedure. Uh, the IR must be placed in the erect bucky uh, lengthwise. Uh, stand the patient centered on the stand. 
feet flat, bring handles down to hold on to. You do not want with this patient to move. The Bell Thompson ruler must be within the field. Detent the tube to 118 inches. Measure uh, from back of the ortho stand to the spine. Enter the measurement into the tube under the um, CMs. Not moving the tube, only angle up so the laser light is at the EAM and press 1 on the tube. This is the first position. Then angle down so the laser light is at the level of the acetabulum and press 2 on the tube. This is the second position. Explain to the patient it is a long breath hold, and I mean long, and they must do their best to hold still and stay still during the movements and the exposures. Expose at the control panel. Repeat setup for the lateral view. Processing the images. Take the blend image off, shift the images until they are lined up perfectly. This is where the Bell Thompson roller helps. Put the blend image back on, save, and send your image. Long leg study. You perform the same as the scoliosis, but the centering will be different. Angle up so the laser light is at the ASI. Angle down so the laser light is at the feet. Ortho table. This can also be performed on the table by selecting ortho table. The IR must be lengthwise. A table at the lowest possible. Lay the patient on the table and as straight as possible. Detent the crop tube crosswise and lengthwise. It does not have to be to the detector. Um, get as much SID as possible. Center the laser midpoint to EAM and then use the acetabulum for scoliosis. Center the laser midpoint ASIS and then feet for both legs. Measure the patient from the table to the spine on the tube and under the ortho tab, press the CM and enter the measurement. Angle up to the EAM for the ASIS. Press 1. Set the first movement. Angle down to the acetabulum or ankles and press 2 and then set the second movement. Explain the long breath hold to the patient and go to the control panel and expose. Conventional tomography. Conventional tomography to obtain a diagnostic image of a specific layer of a tissue or object superimposed by other tissues. A synchronized movement between the tube and the IR. It demonstrates a clear image of an object lying in a specific plane and blurs out the remaining structures. A tomogram, the resultant image, produced. Here is an example of the old school equipment. Control panel and linear tomography. The tomographic unit is operated by its own control panel. The control panel varies. Um, common features are exposure angle, which determines the object plane thickness or section thickness, sectional thickness. Uh, tube travel speed in inches per second or centimeters per second determines the velocity the tube travels. Tube center or preparation, a fulcrum level, which determines the object plane. Linear tomographic setup. Linear tomography is when the equipment moves in one direction. This procedure uses the basic x ray table with the bucking and the tray and radiographic tube connected by a metal connecting arm or rod, usually in the back. This rod passes through an adjustable fulcrum level. The attachment of the height of the fulcrum it can be adjusted. So the total distance of that tube that's traveled is termed a tomographic angle. Conventional tomography. A few terms you should know. Tomography, sometimes termed body section radiography. Blur, an area of distortion outside the object plane. Exposure angle or exposure amplitude. Total distance x-ray tube travels during an exposure. Fulcrum, a pivot point between the movement of the x-ray tube and IR. The level of the height of the fulcrum is measured from the tabletop in inches to centimeters. Object plane, focal plane, plane in which the target anatomy is clear, in focus, controlled by the fulcrum level. Sectional thickness, thickness of an object or focal plane. Tomographic angle, the distance 
of the X-ray tube travels. So another term for tomography is body section radiography, that's right. Tomographic blurring principle, only object plane fulcrum remains in the same position on the IR. The pivot point is important because all structures located at this level are included in the object plane. Structures outside the object plane are projected from one point on the IR to another, resulting in blurring, as seen in the picture here. Section thickness, object plane, adjust the thickness of the object plane to correspond to the structure or thickness being imaged. Small structures are best imaged with using a thin object plane um, created by an exposure angle 40 or greater, a thin cut, as seen in the picture on the right. Large structures, such as the lung, are best imaged using a thick object by the plane by a reduced exposure angle of 10 degrees. There's a thick cut, as an example on the left. How to find the correct levels for a nephrotomogram. When performing a nephrotomogram on an IVU, to find the initial fulcrum level, you're going to use calipers to measure. Measure the thickness of the abdomen at mid-abdomen. Your central ray is going to enter halfway between the xiphoid process and the iliac crest. So you would place the bottom of the IR at the level of the iliac crest. Use the number you just measured here. Take that number and divide by three to get the middle number. Then add one and minus one to get your three levels. So for example, the abdomen is measuring 24 centimeters. Take 24 and divide that by three to equal eight. So eight is your middle number, and then you need a cut above and below. So the three cuts would be seven, eight, nine. For your scalp nephrotomogram, you always use the middle cut. So you would start with eight. This should visualize the middle kidney very well. And then you would use seven and nine to see your upper pole and your lower pole of the kidney. Um, the radiologist may advise you to change your levels once he looks at the scalp. Nephrotomogram is one minute post injection to get the kidneys in full blush phase, which this is an excellent picture here. Um, position, there is no motion um, due to respiration or movement is evident. Um, exposure, appropriate technique is usually demonstrated with a renal parenchyma. Markers, specific focus level markers should be visible on each radiograph along with the right or left marker and minute markers. Digital tomosynthesis. Digital tomosynthesis, new applications made possible for advancing imaging technology. Multiple load dose x-ray projections are required from different angles in a single linear sweep of the tube across the stationary detector. The data acquired is digitally processed reconstruction to form tomographic sections through the imaged object. The structures of each plane are more clearly visible without interface of tissue in front or behind the plane of interest. The end.